Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, and staff. And it brings me great pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished lecture series on Latin, Ameri Latin American arts and culture, presented by the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. My name is Carlos Hernandez, and I'm the executive director for the Latino Student Assembly here on campus. For those who are not familiar with LSA, we're the governing body for over 25 Latino organizations on campus and are responsible for implementing uh, programming initiatives for both our Latino and non-Latino Trojan family. Our organization strives to not only aggregate our own programs, but also partner with other entities on campus to bring awesome opportunities to students like you today, which, by the way, this is open to only students, so really, really feel privileged uh, to be here tonight. So what's cool about schools like Annenberg and organizations like the Latino Student Assembly is that we have understood the importance of conveying diverse narratives across the student body through innovative programming. Not only that, but we've been conscious of the changes USC is undergoing and being open to being diverse and more open to projecting the voices of underrepresented groups. How has USC done that, you might ask? Well, recent uh, statistics have came out saying that this year's incoming class, one of nine students, freshman students, are first generation college students. On top of that, 22% of that same class were from underrepresented communities. Now, as a first generation Salvadoran scholar from the local area, those statistics make me proud to be a Trojan today. And Furthermore, I really feel like it's encouraging uh, to see that our university is making strides to push for more underrepresented groups on camp or in the community to come to this prestigious university. While tonight is a night to celebrate the progress we've made here at USC, it's also a call to action for students to continue to push the envelope and expand the boundaries never seen before. I hope that tonight's talk with world-renowned artist Manu Chao can inspire you and continue to fight on now, with that said, it's an honor to introduce the following gentlemen onto this stage. Josh Kuhn is a professor here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and is also the co-founder of this distinguished lecture series. Please give me a warm, warm welcome for this awesome man, Josh Kuhn. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. Any opportunity to be called awesome in public, I'm thrilled with. Um, thank you, Carlos. Um, thank you. I really want to just thank you all for coming tonight. This is a really, really special night. Um, and I really want to uh, single out the everybody who made this night possible. Um, the entire event staff, uh, our incredible sound and tech staff, uh, everybody worked so hard. This is an event that we pulled together in like a week and a half, uh, which if anyone knows how slow universities work, it's a miracle. Uh, and so the fact that everybody worked so hard to pull this off, it's just, it makes it um, extra special. Um, it's a difficult world. Our distinguished guest tonight says that a lot. Un mundo difficile. It's a difficult world. Sometimes he shouts it, sometimes he sighs it. Like the music he's been making since the mid-1990s, it's a simple statement with complex meanings, a small saying with a cosmic reach. It is also unbearably true. It is a difficult world everywhere you look. It is also, he likes to say, a world gone crazy, crazy with power and death, crazy with money and violence, a world so crazy that it believes that nothing is wrong. He says the latter in English and the former in Italian. Neither of them are languages that he was born into. Our guest tonight is not someone who usually talks about being born into one thing or another, about being native to any flag. He inherits legacies. He adopts others. He moves across the borders erected in his path, the borders erected in all of our paths. Because after all, to speak only one language is not to speak another, which is to say it's not to communicate. It's not to build communities through communication, which is what he does through his recordings and his concerts and his constant pressure on all of us to sing out loud, to use music as a witness to the world, to turn 
infinita tristeza, infinite sadness, into proxima estación esperanza. Next stop, hope. It's a difficult world. And it was a difficult world when he started singing as a co-founder of the influential Parisian genre-hopping band Mano Negra in the 1980s. And it was a difficult world when he debuted as a solo artist in 1998, calling himself a clandestino and aligning himself with people all over the world without papers, standing at the shore's edge in Gibraltar and Tijuana, singing about a world gone crazy with NAFTA and the G8 and the Bush administration and Iraq and Guantanamo and the World Bank, all while still remembering how important it is to kick around the soccer ball, to laugh and to throw a really good party. And most of all, to keep his ears to the streets where he still busks and still serenades. He was lost in the century, he said. And it is still a difficult world. In the age of Hugo Chavez, in the age of Obama, in the age of SB 1070, in the age of earthquakes, in the age of hurricanes, an age when the walls of Israel echo the walls of the US-Mexico border, which once echoed the wall of Berlin. Just look a few hours south at the rising body count of young men and women caught in the crossfire of the narco wars, and you'll see that he is as right as ever now. Politic kills, and the world just keeps going crazy. Resignation, our guest likes to say, is permanent suicide. Instead of giving up, he has urged us all to keep tuning in to the Radio Bembas all around us, to tell truth in the face of lies, and keep singing along in whatever language you need to be heard in the right way. It is not only by shooting bullets in the battlefields that tyranny is overthrown, Subcomandante Marcos once said, but also by hurling ideas of redemption words of freedom against the hangmen, that people bring down dictators and empires. Or as Pete Seeger said, a good song reminds us of what we're fighting for. It's a difficult, difficult world. And tonight we have the great honor of talking about it with someone who has dedicated his life to songs that remind all of us what we should be fighting for. So please welcome Manu Chao. So, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have ghosts from your past. Can you guys hear me? Hello. My Test. past? Hey, hey, hello, hello. Hello, there we go. It's always when you make the funny voice <laughs> that it comes on. How you doing? Good. Are you guys happy? Good. Are you excited? <laughs> Little bit nervous, but okay. We're gonna have some laugh, no? <laughs> There'll be plenty of laughs. Um, I, I wanted to start tonight by playing a song that I don't know if you're going to recognize. Uh huh. Are you cool with this? Let's go. Okay. And just we should say, linguistically, we're going to do this in whatever works. I'm a musician, but I'm deaf too. So no okay, problem. cool. All right. <laughs> Any kind of song. <laughs> So this is a song, if we could pull it down just a little. This is a song uh, originally written in 1892 uh, by a man named Mario Garcia Coli, who wrote the song under the name Fernan Sanchez. I was almost born, but... Uh... No. <laughs> <laughs> who, according to your father, uh -huh. the man who wrote this song in 1892 was your father's Cuban grandfather. Sorry, can you repeat again? <laughs> now, I know that you 
know that your father likes to stretch some stories once in a while. No, my father, uh, no, my father, I saw him, I saw him f- one week ago or two. He's okay, thank you. <laughs> but who wrote this song? <laughs> According to your father, Not my father, uh, uh, his that it was his grandfather who was a, a Cuban minister who ended up being ambassador to Spain who met your great grandmother who was from Galicia who uh-huh. went to work in the ministry in Spain. I mean, in, in, in Cuba. Well, um, I heard thousand and thousand of stories of my grandfather in Cuba. That's one more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's true because. Well, my father told me the story thousand of times, and it was always different. So, and <laughs> the in the village of, of my father, where of course Galicians, my father is from Galicia, northwest of Spain, very special culture. Not far from Irish people, same Celtic culture. Uh, very far from flamenco and all kind of Spanish stuff. And um, so the, the Galicia used to emigrate a lot because it was no food there for a long time. So people go South America. Mm-hmm. Irish people went North America, Galician South America in a certain way to go quick. So in my family, I th- my grandfather went to Cuba. I never understood what he done there because thousands of stories. Uh, but I'm I'm quite sure he didn't wrote this song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it up with your dad. Taking it up with your dad. Uh, in one of your songs, um, you've you've said the following. You said, "I need my father to show me where I come from." Yeah. I need my mother to show me where I'm going. Yeah. Your mother uh, was Basque. My mother is from Basque country, Bilbao. She had to live with four years old because of the, the civil war. So my grandfather was sentenced to death after leave. And so that's why I'm born in France. And how did that, both the history of Cuban culture and Cuban music in your family and growing up, I mean, how did that shape you growing up in France? Well, uh, I'm born in France. I've been raised in France in, um, in, the, in school in France, public school in France, important. I'm proud of that. And, um, and home, we used to speak Spanish, of course, with my father. And we never talk French with my father, I, I think. We always speak Spanish and Spanish, Spanish. Mm-hmm. And my mother, a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of French. So I've, I've been raised with both cultures. Mm-hmm. Just like part of my neighborhood, because in my neighborhood, there was people from a lot of other countries too, like a lot of people from North Africa from Portugal, from Spain too. By the time was the massive immigration, mm-hmm. was this one. So we were a lot like that in the neighborhood, having a mix of both cultures. So I learned French culture, I learned Spanish culture, and South American culture in a certain way, but the, all the, I say CD, but it was not CD, it was <laughs> vinyl, uh, I don't know the word in English, vinyl. Uh, yeah. Yeah? Vinyl. How you say that in English? Vinyl. Vinyl. Yeah, vinyl. Uh, yeah. vinyl. Um, so, from my father, from, uh, from his grandfather, mm-hmm. so a lot of Cuban music. I always remember my favorite was Bola de Nieve. I was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my professor, my first professor of music, I should say. My first professor of swing is Bola de Nieve, for sure. So, thank you. And uh, I was a big fan when I was young. And when I was a little kid, five, six years old, I was a big fan of Bola de Nieve. And, and still now, we still play one of his songs on shows. And um, I think I have it. it. Can we hear Bola de Nieve? This is his original version. And you heard this growing up at home? Always. That was my favorite. Por el monte Carole. Por el monte Carule, que me lo dijo mi padre. I was fan of that. Muchos yeah. animales por el monte Carule. Iñale bambule, 
We still sing that on shows. Yeah. <laughs> and people like it. <laughs> it works. Good professor. <laughs> but now your, your, your professor was also, well, not a direct professor, but the first percussion instruments you were given came from somebody very important in the history of Cuban music and the study of Cuban music. Uh, maybe you're talking about Alejo Carpentier? Yes. That was a friend of my, uh, of my father. So he used to come home and also bring Cuban instruments to me. Mm -hmm. so, so he was also part of, the, of my Latino America background by the time. And also by the time Paris was a place where a lot of refugees come from South America because it was time of dictatures and so there was a lot of, when I was young in Paris, a lot of people from Chile, of course, from, mm -hmm. from Brazil, from Argentina. So they used to, all the activists, they have to left South America. A lot of them were in Paris. And uh, they used to come every Sunday home, eating and talking very important things I couldn't understand by the time. But, but it was there, it's part of my background, mm -hmm. for sure. There's that old saying that, of, of Lorca's, that to be a good Spaniard, you have to have a little bit of Latin American in you. Uh, I don't know what it means to be a good Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> Spaniard is a lot of countries, different countries and different cultures, so I just like to say what is to be a good Brazilian. Brazilian is so big, so much different countries, so much different cultures. I mean, that, that Spain means nothing for me, it's only a flag. That approach of thinking about nationality has been crucial to the way you've thought about music um, over the years. And in the early days in Paris when you were um, playing in bands and eventually from Hot Pants, um, Les Hot Pants. Hot Pants? Hot Pants, yeah, okay. from James Brown song. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were listening to a lot of R&B as well from, from the US? Uh, more from England. Okay. We were, uh, there was this kind of what they called by the time, just before, just before punk, this what they called the pub rock, mm -hmm. like p bands like Dr. Feelgood. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were really inspired by what was coming from, from uh, East End, uh, London. Yeah, for sure, Dr. Feelgood. So we, we met this band called Hot Pants. Why the name? Because we had a manager that was totally crazy. <laughs> After him, all my, experience in music was quite easy. But we found a <laughs> lot of shows because the name Hot Pants because my, my, we found a lot of shows because he, at the end of the show he always get drunk and play drums with his dick. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it's, it was our way to find shows. <laughs> Very good manager. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Well, we, we, don't, we don't have a picture of that, but we have a picture of you, yeah. Yeah, uh, not the same, I'm sorry. <laughs> not same size. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, what's interesting when you go back and listen to Hot Pants is you're singing a lot in English. Yeah. Um, we, 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 yeah. But some in Spanish as well. A little songs. bit. We used to yeah. play only, sing only in English because it was, uh, we were really involved in rock and roll and Singing rock and roll in French for us was something impossible. <laughs> it doesn't fit at all. Mm. It was, uh, some bands in France tried to do that, but we thought it was really totally impossible to hear that. It was, no, French and rock and roll didn't fit. It took me years to understand that it was possible. When I started listening to the real French rock and roll that are the singers from the 30s, mm -hmm. 20s, like Frel, like all this, this music from Cabaret, from France, the, all these real singers of rock and roll, the real r rock and roll lyrics, I should say, mm -hmm. that was from the 30s, 40s. And when we, we were um, teenagers, we didn't listen to that because it was kind of music for old people, so we didn't even listen. Mm. But when I started listening, even people more recent like Jacques Brel or Edith Piaf, uh, Edith Piaf, she's a real rocker, mm -hmm. but it took me a long time to understand that. <laughs> yeah, because we were involved with really uh, English music, rock and roll. So we, we wrote only songs 
in English, quite stupid at the beginning, because our English was quite limited. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but it works better than in French, because uh, in French it doesn't fit. And maybe I'm born in France, I've been raised in France, and maybe French is the last, really last um, language I'd used to write songs. Hmm. And now, personally, I really love to write songs in French. It's a real pleasure. But it took me a long, long, long time. And, and what do you think in that long time, what's changed for you? Is it that France has changed, or your attitude toward France has changed? Toward French, oh, uh, something happened really important for me. I left France. <laughs> 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 so, so when I was a teenager, my obsession was to leave France. I didn't want to leave there. I, I didn't feel happy there. Uh, the, the name, there was no life for us. There was no nothing. Uh, after eight o'clock at night, there was nothing. Only us, the gas oil station, and police. So gas oil station to pick up beers, mm -hmm. and drink the beers behind the gas oil station, <laughs> and wait for the police to come. <laughs> <laughs> and after the game, well, or we run, or we make them run. <laughs> That was the every night game, and pff, there was not a, a big future in that, you know. <laughs> and, and I'm sad now it's exactly the same 20 years after in France, maybe even worse. So nothing has changed. So when I was a teenager, I really want to leave France. That was, I think all my songs in English was talking about that. I want to leave from here. <laughs> And, uh, and now, with uh, years after, I'm proud of that. I left. I'm really proud of that. I, I, I've been able to leave France. And now, when I go back there, at least I can see the positive things too. Because by the time, I couldn't. I really remember one day I was watching TV. I was a teenager. And the news. And they say that Paris was the most visited city in the world. And I, I say, what are they coming to see here? There's nothing. <laughs> I couldn't understand. I couldn't. And I want to leave, I want to leave, I want to leave. And I left. So now when I go back, I go back with different highs. I can even recognize that when I go to Paris, Paris is a very beautiful city. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very cold heart. The feeling is not there for sure. But the city is beautiful. I couldn't see that when I was a teenager. And so to what extent was when Mano Negra was created in the late 80s, was that an attempt to put a little pachanka into, to put a little feeling and a little of the no, heart? No, Mano Negra, about? really quick, in France when we start music, it was for me too much separated in kind of get, musical ghettos. Rock with rock, reggae with reggae, salsa with salsa, and nobody mixed together. And uh, I loved all this, all this kind of music because uh, I, by the time I went a lot to Spain, uh, every, of course, every, every holidays I used to go to Spain. And rock and roll there was very different. Mm -hmm. the, the rock and roll, uh, like with electric guitars, was, I think, more middle class. The real rock and roll was uh, rumba, flamenco, rumba. The, the real bad boys was listening to that music, not to rock. And... Um, so we start to mix this, also all the, the Latin thing mm -hmm. that we had for a long time. And so we tried to mix everything. But by the time in France, um, there was this kind of ghettos. You couldn't play everything in one band because this was not possible. You know, sometimes rock and roll is very conservative. Uh, people have also in kind of... So by the time, it was impossible to mix. If you play in a rock band, you do rock. If you play reggae, you do reggae, but you don't mix. Mm -hmm. It was 20 years ago or more. And so we... The first thing that made that we start to mix different musical ghettos was the problem we had in Paris with, uh, with fascists. We had all the, all the musical... We had problems with the same guys that were the skinheads, fascists. So we have all to have trouble with, with these guys. So little by little, all the communities tried, decided to, to get together to don't have problems with the fascists. So maybe that's, that's the, 
the most important thing that made that the culture starts to mix mm -hmm. and the musical culture start to mix in Paris by the time I'm uh, talking about late 80s. Yeah. Yeah, or early 80s maybe. Because we had a big problem with neo-Nazis. Mm -hmm. And all the communities have big problems with these guys. So we decide to, 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 to make shows all together to, to feel strong. Mm -hmm. And after the problem was, was resolved like that. And musically also, I, I need to play in a in lot of bands to, to play all the music I like. So I decided to form one band when I could play anything I like. And I think that was Mano Negra. You, you, you once said, and I, ever since I've read this, I've never known what you meant. So I don't know if you remember saying this, but a long time ago you said that um, Pachanka, the, the sound of Mano Negra, was chorizo mentality. And I've always loved the idea that there could be a chorizo mentality. Because chorizo... <laughs> 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 Because we call, uh, uh, by the time in Spain, un chorizo, we call un chorizo a bad boy. This like guy is manager. a chorizo, he's a, he's a bad boy. My manager, by the time, was the worst chorizo <laughs> made in my life. <laughs> no, it was, really, ooh, it was really crazy. Yeah. They're, they're in we can talk hours about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? He was not only a good drummer, a lot, a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, in, uh, in 1989, and I don't know if I'm getting this right, but I found this very interesting. In 1989, Mano Negra uh, opened up um, a festival that was a Communist Party festival uh, in Paris that the Stray Cats yeah. also played. Uh -huh. So Mano Negra I have no problem thinking of at a Communist Party festival, but the Stray Cats took me, took me by surprise. Oh, no, because the, the Communist Fiesta of Paris is something, is the best party in all France. <laughs> No, it's true. Nobody goes there for political reasons. <laughs> Some are going. But the, it's the, real, the only real popular mm -hmm. uh, festival that exists actually in France, still now. Mm -hmm. We went against two years ago. It's always a pleasure to play there. Mm -hmm. All people really, you know, from all the, the working class, from all France coming there, making their own little bars. You can get drunk everywhere. And, and it's a beautiful festival. It's, not a qu it's, not, it's much more than a political festival. It's much more than that. All friends are going to tell you that, even people that are not communists. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes there because it's really a festival, really the more popular festival you can find in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And any time they're going to call me to play there, I will. It's very cheap. The, the tickets, you can see by the time the Stray Cats or very big bands from everywhere mm -hmm. for very low cost and, and get drunk all around and, and, and have a real, real popular party. And in France, it's very difficult till I'm a teenager to experience a popular party because a lot of tension, because a lot of, yeah, a lot of tension in the neighborhoods. The popular parties of my neighborhoods I never saw in my life. They, they existed, but they started at 10, and 10.30 was over because general fight. Mm. It was finished. Mm -hmm. So I, I never experienced that in France. But La Fête de l'Huma, where nobody calls in the, the party of Parti Communist, they call it Fête de l'Huma. That um, it's, it's a wonderful place to, to go. If you are in France in September, Go there, for sure, it's very nice, it's very good atmosphere. One of the things that's been um, particularly interesting to watch over your career is the way that in your music from Mano Negra to your current solo work is the repetition and kind of recurring roles that certain characters play, little sounds or little, mm -hmm. little characters. And yeah. I wanted to introduce one character um, that comes from this guy, Dave Bartholomew. Um, which was a, a really important New Orleans R&B tune that I want to play for the audience because my guess is many haven't heard it before. Yeah. The monkey speaks his mind. Now, three monkeys sat in a coconut tree discussing things as they are said to be. Say it one to the other, now listen you two, there's a certain rumor that can't be true, 
that man descended from our noble race. The very idea is a big disgrace. No monkey ever deserted his wife, starved her baby, and ruined her life. Yeah. So it was Dave the Bartholomew's speaks his mind. character of the monkey who speaks his mind mm-hmm. um, in the jungle, who uses wit and language to battle. And over your career, you've had many different versions yeah. of, of that monkey. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the first one was in King of Bongo. Eh? Yeah. Well, I don't remember. Maybe if he's there. Thanks for helping. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, King Kong Five is a, di- is a different monkey. Um, I don't know. I have to ask my psychanalyst, but I've never <laughs> been there already. One day I told you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what does that character represent for you? Hard to say, but I always like this song about these three monkeys in a tree looking for you know, humanity, how it's going, and saying, all these guys are going totally crazy, you know? To get in your tree and watching what, all what's happening from your tree, what's happening downtown LA or downtown, downtown Paris or Barcelona or anywhere. And uh, what do you think about it? Mm-hmm. The like kind of originals, no? They, are, they were there before us. And they, they're supposed to be our ancestors, ancestors, mm-hmm. English. And just talking, like in a bar, but what's happening down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So this is one example of what happened to Dave Bartholomew's Sound Market in the studio was Kari Manonegra to some fantasy send you for you monkeys. <laughs> But th- now that, that, that track comes off of uh, a very important record, especially in terms of your relationship to Latin America. The great record is the Casa Babilón, um, uh-huh. one of the masterpieces, I think, of, of, uh, of all kinds of post-everything music. Um, yeah. And um, that, that record was, was obviously crucial um, in Mano Negra's history toward the end, um, but also because it gave us many songs that addressed not just um, these different characters and different traditional songs, but also d- address politics head on uh, and gave us a song like Senor Matanza um, that I think, and I hadn't listened to that song in a long time and in, in preparing for, t- for today, listened to it again. And the, the, the lyrics of that song um, where you talk about mines, farms, seas, federales, syndicates, bishops, generals, schools, all of them being owned by Senor Matanza. Yeah, nothing new. <laughs> it's, um, it's all around, I mean, and it's more and more. That's what uh, really scares me for the future of, um, of our sons. I think it's mafia is growing, growing, growing everywhere. I think uh, the worst enemy of democracy actually is not anymore uh, military dictature. It's going to be the mafia dictature. And it's coming. It's coming really quick. And one day, mafia is going to be stronger than democracy, and we're going to live in dictature. And uh, military dictature is going to be something really light compared with the mafia's dictature. It's already happening in Russia in a certain way. It's already happening in Mexico in a certain way too, but it's, it's coming up everywhere. And, um, and uh, yes, I always say that for years. I think the, the, the dictature of, of the 21st century is not military, it's mafia. I mean, it's, it's military too, but without the, 
would, would not officially, I should say. And it's very, 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 very dangerous. And really think, and politicians do nothing. Maybe they're scared already. Um, I don't know what's happening, but it's, it's obvious. It's obvious. More and more, all the places I go and I have the opportunity to travel, mafia is ruling. That's why for years, um, maybe 15 years ago, uh, and everybody said we were totally irresponsible. Uh, we, we, we was always saying on press and everywhere that we want legalization of, of all drugs, even hard drugs. Because, because uh, all the business of drugs, it's money for mafia. And mafia is the worst enemy of democracy. And, uh, but everybody say, ah, oh, these guys are crazy, these guys, but it's, it's obvious. I think it's, um, but maybe now it's too late. That's what I don't know. But um, it's, it's an evidence that mafia lives a lot because of the traffic of drugs. Mm -hmm. So why governments led to mafia all this big piece of the cake? Why? That's the big question. When you, when you wrote that song, how much was the situation specifically in, in the Colombia a part of how you wrote that song? Well, that was the, that was the 1993. Yeah. That was the big moments of Pablo Escobar. And all the, in all the world, everybody was talking about Colombian mafia. Maybe my opinion is that everybody will start talking about Colombian mafia because Colombian mafia was not ruling anymore. Mm -hmm. I really believe by the time all the business was already in Mexico. But everybody needed to have a bad boy and uh, to say and to say, okay, the problem is Colombia. But Escobar was already. Well, Escobar was a dead man till the day he said he was anti-American. Because he worked with them for a long time, and the day he decided to work without them, he was a dead man. And uh, when he decided that, he became the public enemy international number one. Mm -hmm. That started when he stopped working with Americans. Before, nobody heard about him, and they made a lot of money together. That's something that is obvious in Colombia. Everybody knows that, I think. Well, and uh, whenever everybody starts to talk about the traffic in Colombia, I really believe the traffic was somewhere else. It was only for journalists and to, to show up that something. But Pablo was dead. And, um, and I, don't, I don't think that Pablo was a good guy. I don't get Pablo was fucking mafioso and bad guy. And it's mafia. It's, I'm not. Um, at all making something a great guy about this guy. This guy was a fucking problem. And, um, but he was like a kind of, I don't know how to say in English. I really believe that by the time, the business was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And f for sure in Mexico. So for you... That's only my opinion. Yeah. No. What's the, is there a line, I mean, how do we go from Senor Matanza to politic kills? Which is to say, is there, is there a blur, is the line very blurry now in the 21st century between the mafia and politicians and, gover and the government? Well, uh, Senor Matanza, I think there's no kind of possible uh, debate, you know, that's another word. Uh, debate. Debate about the song. Senor Matanzas all around the world are like, as, are, as it's said in the song. Politic kills made a lot of more of debate. Some people argue me, Manu, why you say that? Uh, it's not true what you're saying. Politic can be good too. And they're not wrong, it's true. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you can do politic in your neighborhood, you can do politic in a lot of places in your own way in a good way. So saying, as I say in my song, as a statement, politic kills, some people didn't accept intellectually what I was saying. And, and I understand, so it's, it's talk about, it's, 
But uh, what I, in my song, I talk about the professional politic. And I think um, in all, uh, in all kind of countries, I think, politic kills. Politic doesn't kill always. Politic kills only if, if politic needs to kill. If they can buy, they buy. Easier. If they can make little present, um, if they can buy, they buy. But if, if they have to kill, they kill. That's called in France uh, la raison d'état. I don't know how you call that in English. Stay, uh, stadual reason, I don't know. Reason of the state. Yeah, I don't know the word in English, I'm sorry. <laughs> would, you, would you maybe play a little bit of that song for us? Did you bring your guitar? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a little? <laughs> okay. Politiki mani, politiki mani, politiki mani, ja politiki mani. Uba nege nege na suliteli, uba ja fala suliteli. Politik need votes. Politics needs your mind. Politics needs human beings. Politics need lives. That's why, my friend, it's an evidence. Politics kills. That's why, my friend, it's an evidence. Politics is violence. It's an evidence. Politics needs drugs. Politics use bombs. Politic needs torpedoes, politic needs blood. That's why, my friend, it's an evidence. Politic kills. That's why, my friend, it's an evidence. Politic is violence. It's an evidence. Politic money, ja politic money. Politic money. Ja politiki ma Uba nege nege na Sulitele Uba ja fala Sulitele Politik need force Politik need crime Politik need ignorance Politik need lies Why so many? Thank you. How did you decide in, in writing that song, how did you decide which languages to use when? I don't remember. Uh, no, I don't remember because um, my songs are already writing all around and uh, I never really remember what I start writing a song or not, because sometimes you don't write a song in one day, you write a little part there, little part there, and it takes time. Some, some songs you write in five minutes, rack. They are the most beautiful ones in the moment. It's, a kind, of, it's kind of orgasmic, I should say. <laughs> it's beautiful. You feel very proud after. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it takes more time. And when it takes more time, it's also funny. It's a kind of... You, you have a piece of song. My, my opinion is never force. Whenever you got a good idea, even if it's not a totally song, if you got only two, three sentences and you don't find naturally the fourth one, stop. Don't try to force you. It's going to be bullshit. So stop. Maybe you're going to finish this song one year after or two years or sometimes it happened ten years after. But let it flow naturally. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can take you a lot of time to, for writing a song, sometimes not. And the language, it's not you that decide, it's the, the moment. Mm -hmm. Whenever you write the first idea of the song, 
that's the decision. But the decision, it's not you that decide, it's inspiration. Mm -hmm. So inspiration can be like a funny thing said by one of your friends in a bar or something you see in the street or something that happened to you. You never know how it's going to happen and in which language. So it's not me that decides I'm going to write about that in this language. No, it's something that happens. I say, what? Okay, good idea. It's coming from I don't know where. Sometime from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite often. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> the reason I asked is I remember actually something that um, someone we both knew, um, uh, Luis Guarena uh, in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. um, people would ask him, Luis, why do you always sing in English if you're Mexican? And he would say, it's cabrones me entienden. So, so, yeah. so is that is that ever important to you that I'm going to sing this in English? Because I want people, I want the right people to hear no, it. No, no, I don't think about that. I think when you write a song, uh, it's something really egoistic. I'm writing for myself, and I try to understand myself. It's a hard thing. Uh, that's my only. It's something really personal. Uh, I think if you start. And that's my only op own opinion, and everybody got his way of writing songs. I don't say that's the best way. But uh, for me, it's a moment that I have with myself or with somebody else if we share the song and the idea. That is, the important thing is to understand yourself when you write the song. And if so other people understand this song, in the same way as me, or another way, it works. But I think it's very, for me, it's, it wouldn't be good to say, oh, I'm going to talk to these guys about that in this way. I, I'm talking, I don't have the pretension when I write a song to, to make it listen to a lot of people. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't write nothing. Mm -hmm. I write for myself, because it's my little therapy. That's my own little therapy. And if this little therapy works for other people, I feel really happy. <laughs> but in the instant, the important thing that it's worth for me, mm -hmm. because I'm there with my pen and with my, and uh, it's something that I have to make something good for me. Mm -hmm. and, and you've worked hard to, to in a way, um, take seriously the way that your music moves other people. Um, and that's obviously been a big part of um, your various interactions with various kinds of, of social movements. Um, for example, you're somebody who has been very active and very supportive of so-called anti-globalization campaigns and movements uh, against and critiquing things like the G8. And I'm just wondering for you, it's a word that gets thrown around very loosely, globalization. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering for, for, for us here, how do you understand that term and what's your relationship to it? I don't know. Um, yesterday we talked a little bit and you asked me the question in a different way. You asked yeah, me, what is global yeah. for you? And I answered, I cannot answer this question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I went to the toilets and came back. <laughs> <laughs> and and say, I found my first answer. If tomorrow you ask me this question, I'm going to say, global is everything. Global is the universe. It's the earth, the universe, everything. Some people may call that God. Me, I call that universe. Uh, so that's global. After, let's talk politically. Okay. Can you? Repeat the question, please. Sure. <laughs> because globalization is a word that is, is used by many different people in different ways. Uh -huh. um, for you, what does it mean as you think about it as an artist? And I'm still sorry that the question is too huge. Yeah. Uh, globalization, I need... In what? The, uh, there's the economical globalization, right. the... the how, you, how to communication mm -hmm. globalization, there's the cultural globalization. Mm -hmm. For sure, now and day, to, 
all the cultures of the world are much more connected than before, culturally, economically, in everything. So, for sure, now and day, uh, talking by countries is more and more totally stupid. There's only one Earth, and nobody's going to be saved if we don't resolve the problem globally. Mm -hmm. If not, there's going to be always problems. Uh, I think that what I should say now, without thinking about it, but the problem is global. The, everything is global now, even the culture, even the, but the, the important part is the economical part, because the world is ruled by economy and the world is ruled by money. And, uh, and, and the, the, all the democratic world say we live in democracy, it's not true. We live in dictature, dictature of money. Money rules the world. Who got money, who don't have money. So after they can talk about democracy, it's not true. Because we're voting for people that don't have any more any kind of power to deal against money. That's for sure. And now, I say that for years maybe, but I really believe that actually when they say, the politicians say that democracy and go to vote is an act that everybody can do, that it's for everybody. It's not true. When we go everybody for vote, we go voting for people that don't have any power of decision. They got a little bit, but not the real one. Actually, who got the real power is economy. So if you want to really vote, you have to pay for your vote. You have to, be, uh, you have to buy actions in a company. If you buy actions in a company, you buy your right to vote for real things, real decisions that are going to be influenced in all around the world. So the vote for everybody, it's a lie. The only people that really can vote and influence things, influence the Iraq war, or influence a lot of things, are actionists. They paid for their vote. So how then is change enacted if it's not through voting the game where, where is the, conversation the, the, ga the game is totally is totally instable it's, it's not standable right. that's going to break somewhere it's it's not standable anymore it's not standable I mean, but the democracy they talk about is not real it's not real if you really want to vote you have to pay for your vote you have to be actionist of a society one or the other, or the, but mm -hmm. so you can influence your society that got a certain influence economically in the world, mm -hmm. and that gonna say give orders to our presidents mm -hmm. in a certain way. It's a little caricatural what I'm saying, but in a certain way I think it's like that. And I'm not economist. What I'm saying is just what I think. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. Don't take like that, like. Uh, but I believe that personally. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, obviously. Um. <laughs> so I want to, I want to, yeah, yeah. I want to, so a lot of kids and people and friends of mine, we got this debate, debate, must we say in yeah, English? Debate. I learned one word today. <laughs> 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 debate in, in, in a lot of places we talk about that, people that go, that go voting and some, lot of friends that say, I don't go voting anymore, I don't go. I can understand them. Personally, I always go voting. My, my grandfather had been sentenced to death because he fought for the right of vote. So only for the respect of my grandfather and for a certain ideal of democracy, I'm going to go voting every time. My big problem, and I think the, we are thousands and thousands like that, and millions, is that till I got the right to vote, I was 18. Um, I never, never, never voted for somebody I liked. <laughs> I vote for the last worst guy that was. <laughs> <laughs> but that means democracy is sick. Mm -hmm. That's the first symptom. Because I know we are millions like that. Mm -hmm. We never voted for somebody that we really believed in. We, we make the, the vote utile, I don't know the word in English, 
uh, useful vote, what we're talking. All my life I voted like that. That's, I think it's, it's not uh, healthy. Mm -hmm. it's not, that's not uh, healthy democracy. And so the solution, and we're fighting for that in, in Spain with little movements, but we, we got not a big, um, that's what we call the le vote en blanc. I don't know how you call that in the US, and if it's permitted or. When you, you vote, but you vote for nobody. Blank. Blank vote, that's it. So, so that would be the solution. The problem is the blank vote is not contabilizado. Counted. Counted. So if you vote blank, you vote for the one that's going to win. But if the blank vote would be counted, we should we be quickly the majority. And that would prove that all the political business, political business nobody believes in them. But they don't accept this rule in democracy to accept the blank vote like something real existing. You vote blank, but they don't say, OK, uh, Democrats 35, Republicans 22, blank 63. <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't, they are not able to take this challenge. Because for sure we should win. It's, it's sure. There's no doubt. So we, we try to fight for that, to, to the blank vote to be contabilizado mm -hmm. as a party. We believe in nobody of you. That's my vote. <laughs> One of the ways that this connects up with a lot of things that you've written about and sung about in your music, um, obviously, is the state of migrants across the world. Currently, around 200 million migrants in the world, 50% of them mm -hmm. women, um, who travel and move because of money, in many, ca in many cases, money and politics. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you started writing about being clandestino, being uh, writing for people in the video for clandestino, for example, right? We see some, we see different, we, you know, we see different faces with different passports and different papers. Um, how is that in the t 10 years or more since you wrote clandestino? Well, are you thinking? Yeah. Well, are, uh, yeah, late 90s. Are you thinking about migrants now obviously in Arizona in this country we're going through a major it's crisis. getting worse it's getting worse but by the time it was really a problem uh, but everybody knows here down in the border with Mexico a lot of people are dying and also in Europe I mean in Gibraltar between Morocco and Spain a lot of people are dying every year it's uh, it's amazing much more people die uh, every year in uh, Gibraltar, Detroit, than in 60 years of Berlin Wall. Mm. Every year. It's more people dying in one year, actually, than 60 years of Berlin Wall. That's a statistic. Mm. And, um, and so everybody in the news in France is okay. Uh, 20 people died, next day 40, next day. It's terrible. It's it's, and it's totally an hypocrisy of Occident in a, in a sense that Occident Occident got a big problem. Occident is getting old, so the youth is not anymore in Occident. Ox the youth is in the third world. Occident is statistically is getting old, so. Uh, a society in good health need youth, and the youth is in the third world. So you have to, if Occident want the future, they need the youth, and the youth is outside. So we need to open the borders for the youth. But uh, but the real problem is that the governments, and it's not the governments; it's again the economy. They don't want youth with papers, mm -hmm. because a youth, youth with paper can get a syndicate, can get, and can ask for their rights. Yeah, they really less. prefer youth without papers, mm -hmm. because they can be treated like slaves. 
And that's what's happening. All the governments say they, f they fight against uh, immigration, illegal Im immigration, is a big hypocrisy. Part of the economy of agriculture in US or in Spain or in, in Europe and, uh, and the factories too are working and making money because of illegal immigration. So that's what is not what is not standable, and what's the big hypocrisy of of politicians, mm -hmm. because they don't say the truth. One of the songs that I think expresses that really well, in in of the many that you have that address this issue, is um, reflects your relationship to one border city in particular, not too far from here, mm -hmm. two hours south, uh, uh, Tijuana, Mexico. Could you sing um, a little bit of Bienvenida Tijuana? Okay. Bienvenida a Tijuana, bienvenida a mi amor, de noche a la mañana, bienvenida a mi amor, bienvenida a mamacita, ay mi ruta Babilón, bienvenida a la cena, sopita de camaro. Calavera no llora, serenata de amor. Calavera no llora, no tiene corazón. Por la Panamericana, bienvenida a la aduana, bienvenida a mi suerte, a mí me gusta al verte. I wanna go to San Diego I wanna go y no puedo Bienvenida a la Juana Thank you. Gracias. So I want to I want to ask you one more question and then we'll open it up and and I'll have a conversation. No hurry. Um, but I want to see if I can get this back up. <coughs> and fast forward. We can talk about that too. But I want to start. I want to talk about this for a second. Ah, oh, nice. And I, I want to talk about um, before we the specifics of this about the role of radio. Um, throughout your career, you've had very different radios have figured. Um, and and I'm just wondering for you how. Why has radio been so important? I mean, we've got Radio Bemba, Radio Lina, there's been the Easy Alain radio, um, and now your latest project uh, is, a, is a radio of a very different kind. My answer is I don't know. <laughs> Another question for my psychoanalyst if one day I find one. <laughs> Maybe next year, you want to come back with your psychoanalyst? We can all be here. Uh, I, I, I'll t have to find one. <laughs> and then no one... No one I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, but it's true. I always use this word. I think radio is something that has to do with a kind of easy communication. My band is Radio Bemba. My, my, my father worked on radio. Mm -hmm. My brother is working on radio. Um, and... Uh, I cannot tell why I uh, oh, so much use. Maybe it's the kind of communication diffusion, but I, I, should, I could say television or mm -hmm. <laughs> something else. No, but radio is something that, um, and even more now, now it's very interesting with internet. Mm -hmm. All the radios, the connection is very interesting on that point of internet. Mm -hmm. It's very, very interesting. But the best radio I met in my life and maybe being the best psychanalyst I found in my life uh, are these guys, Radio Colifata. I think maybe it's the best recordings I made in my life. Uh, radio Colifata is a little radio from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. So that the particularity, uh, the radio is emitted from a psychiatric hospital by the patients of the, of the hospital. And we, we are working together for almost 10 years now. We made shows together, we made CDs together. We, we made a lot of things together and these guys are, 
became for me kind of masters of thinking. They are totally incredible people. They helped me a lot to understand this world because society say they are crazy and um, and maybe they are like we are, but um, but they got something really extraordinary. Is they got a power of synthesizer. Mm -hmm. They can synthesize. Eh. They are pff, they are Maradonas of synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are the best because you have you have a talking like that with them like we are now, and we, maybe we're gonna talk about God or about war in Iraq uh, and we're going to uh, of course uh, uh, talking about war in Iraq we can we can be talking hours and hours but one of them going to stand up and say two words and it's finished because he said everything <laughs> and they are totally incredible persons uh, there's a website called vivalacolifata.org where we we've been working two CDs together, recorded in the hospital, but near the hospital because the, the hospital didn't allow us to record inside. And um, I can play a little so people can get a taste. Yeah, Just a bit. you can play, but I think the, the real thing it's really. demasiado loco por el cual estoy internado acá en el borda es la locura del sol quiero que todos me conozcan ojalá salga el sol es la locura del sol quiero que todos me conozcan ojalá salga el sol amo las estrellas la luna pero en especial amo el sol ojalá salga el sol es la locura del sol quiero que todos me conozcan ojalá salga el sol el sol no mata a nadie es la locura especial que tengo para mí el sol es libertad ojalá salga el sol es la locura del sol quiero que todos me conozcan ojalá Ojalá salga el sol, ojalá más que tibio y brillante para que reluzcan las alas de las aves y las aguas de mi laguna y los cuerpos desnudos de los árboles secos y la tranquera opaca y la tierra buena. Ojalá salga el sol, ojalá salga el sol. Esto es la novedad. Dice así, querría poder hacer alguna buena carta, pero es inútil. Recuerdo a la radio y a toda la gente. Estoy bien, proyectos buenísimos. Les iré haciendo saber. Aquí de pensión en pensión. Ojalá salga el sol. El alquiler barato. La gente más tranquila. Felicidades. Que les garúe. Chao. Besos y abrazos. Ojalá salga el sol. Y el sol para mí es lo más importante. Tengo casilla de correo. Ojalá salga el sol. El alquiler barato. Ojalá salga el sol. Tengo casilla de correo. Ojalá salga el sol. El alquiler barato. Ojalá salga el sol. No me siento mal. Lo que siento, decir lo que siento, decir lo que siento. El sol, que es lo que más me gusta, nos iluminó esta tarde. Es la locura del sol. Son maravillas que pasan por mi corazón. Uh, so Radio La Colifata, as part of that, we recorded thousands of songs. It was like being here, like we are now. Little recording here, well, without this, but that. And everybody came and recorded what he wanted to talk about. And uh, that was totally incredible. Uh, it's hard to talk about that. I really suggest you, you go on this site and, and enjoy by yourself. It's not a CD to, to put in a party. It's something to listen and really what is important are the lyrics, what they're saying. I think it's very, 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 very... Interesting. I mean, the, the the idea that kept being repeated in that one piece that the, that the sun will, the sun will come up, the sun will arrive, um, and this guy he, he was he wanted to talk about the sun. He said, "I'm crazy. My <laughs> craziness is the sun. So I want to talk about the sun." And what he says is, is very clear. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, so much. You, you talk so much in your music. I mentioned before that the the, the, the repeating theme of infinite sadness and yet there's also the hope and there's the new day and the new sun and, and I think how many people here have seen Manu play a, a, a proper formal concert big show <laughs> so I'm actually hoping can we I, I wanted to show one clip because I think this is important before we before we end is that um, there is for all of the seriousness and um, the darkness of a lot of what you are responding to you give this gift to everyone who comes to your shows and, and it, there's a responsibility on all of us to bring the love with us to the shows. But your concerts are 
uh, that it's their sun's rising. I mean, it's a, it's a, they're joyous events. Yeah, I think that's what I'm proud about, and what I'm proud in our shows. I don't know how it, it happens, so I, but it's it's a fact that I think it's maybe what I'm more proud about what I'm doing in music for years is that um, people that come to our shows are people very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. And maybe people that in everyday life never mix together. And that happens in all kind of country we go. It's, you got uh, students, you got people from the neighborhoods, you got uh, kids, you got the young people, you got old people, you got uh, people from the countryside likes too, people from the big city, people from everywhere, from different cultures, they're all there. And actually in the society, everybody's very separate. Mm -hmm. Nobody know each other. Even the, the, everybody's in his own ghetto, the youth with the youth, all people with all people. So all people are scared of the youth. The youth say all people, only old people. That's very bad for society. And uh, I think we have to find the places where all the communities join together and, and, and try to live together. And I really feel that our shows is a little place like that, for sure. I got no doubt. I'm really proud of that. And I think it's really important. In Europe, for years now, Spain, Portugal, but even now it's getting out. The popular, what we were talking about, the Communist Party, uh, the this, the... We missing, we really missing popular fiestas. That's where all we miss carnival. Mm -hmm. Carnival for for years and years and thousand years is a moment where all the society mix together and everybody can make laugh of each other. That's collective therapy. If we don't have that, we're gonna all kill each other. It's very, very, very important to join all the society, and they have, we got these moments to, to blow the pressure, to be all together and make fun one to the other and, and be together. If we don't have that, tension, tension, tension. All Europe is scared of the youth. All, all people from Europe are scared of the youth because they see the youth only on television, burning cars. That's not the reality. Uh, all the youth don't care about all people because they say they see on they don't even see on TV, <laughs> but uh, because they're not there. <laughs> then they, and, it, and it's very 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 important. And what I'm proud of that is our shows is a little place, but we need more 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 places like that where all the communities join together. Cultural communities, age communities, uh, I don't know the word in English, but yeah, all the, all the society. And so this is just a little taste of what it, it might feel like if we can show that one clip. Canto mi canto antiguo.
You're always See working. My friends. You're always working hard, but I always think Gambit is working a little bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say no. It's true. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'd like to maybe open it up to have some questions from you guys and uh, see what kind of conversations we could have. There are microphones on both sides of the aisles there. So if you could step up. And um, we're going to start here. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Um, it's very appropriate that we're here tonight. I am actually an alumni of USC, but um, I don't know if you know that USC is the first uh, dedicated center of Homeland Security of Excellence. It started here when the Department of Homeland Security began its new um, war on terrorism and USC is housed that, housed that home of excellence and where they do a lot of field work on how to make Homeland Security better. So it's an appropriate question um, that we're here. My question is about the undocumented students, uh, our, what we call AB 540 students, students sin papeles. Um, what, can we, what, what message do you have for those students in with regards to not becoming the slave to the system and how do they how do you feel is a good way for them to overcome or have some sense of encouragement or validity to themselves as human beings as an educator i feel that many times our students are told no existes no papeles no existes can and you ask uh, make me the question in spanish yeah the question please? is oh uh, bueno la pregunta es sí, por favor. Que, no, no, um, la pregunta sería que el centro de usc aquí es un, un centro de educación um, donde aquí uh, manejaron muchas cosas de Homeland Security, de INS. Y aquí mismo um, también hay muchos, muchos límites en los estudiantes que pueden entrar y no pueden entrar. Y también en todos los colegios del, de los Estados Unidos. A un estudiante sin papeles que les dicen, no tienes papeles, no existes. ¿Cómo sigue ese estudiante y qué podrías decirle tú para que, seguir, que sigan en, en la lucha? Eso es el gran problema de de ahora que no es solo aquí, es en Europa, es por todos lados, es la, la gran the big hipocrisy, la gran hipocresía what we were talking before. Um, so, who's got papers, who don't got papers, so who give the papers can decide who's going to learn, who's not going to learn. And that's, uh, that's es una evidencia que eso no es bueno. But it comes to, uh, I think that education would, it's important that education is for everybody. Uh, now I'm going to tell you the truth. I really believe, I really hope my mother not, never going to know that I've been talking in this university that is private because she's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, because in our family, we always fought, fight for for school, for everybody, and public. So, uh, para ser sincero, um, I accepted this reunion now, maybe one month ago, because I knew Josh, and uh, I say okay. But after two days before, I say, my God, it's a private university. <laughs> I never done like that in my life because I never accepted to go talking in a private university. You know, it's the first time I'm doing that and I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of that. I accepted not because it was too late and it was my fault because I didn't ask enough information. But I'm happy to be here, eh? no problem. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have to talk the truth yeah, yeah. because I really believe that what is important is is education for everybody and for free. So, so I really don't understand how United States, that is the more powerful country in the world, uh, is not able to do that for its citizens. When a little and I'm not castrista, I'm not, I'm not doing politics, actually. When a little country like Cuba is able to do that for all its citizens, and how comes that the United States cannot pay education for all the Americans? How Americans have to pay to, to, to go to school? It's amazing. Uh, I think maybe it's a joke, but... Uh, 
the only way if you want to learn in America and get paid, you have to get to the army, you learn to kill. But if you want to learn about something else, you have to pay. Um, that's not a good uh, sign about America. America should pay education for all people living in America. Americans and not Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> that, should be, uh, that should be an act of a country that believes in its future. People that pay people <laughs> to learn about how to kill is a country that is totally scared about its future. Thank you. Hola. Hola. I'll ask in English first and see if you can understand them. If not, I'll translate. You, you talk about the issue of illegal immigration getting worse in this country and all over the world and the hypocrisy with the government and such. So what can people do? I mean, people are always going out in the streets and marching, especially in Arizona and here in California, and people go out to Arizona to go help the cause over there. And people try to get people to register to vote so they can exercise their power that way and get things to change. But if that doesn't work, is there any hope? What can people do? It's very country? hard to, to find solutions, actually, really effective solutions to, to fight the beast, I should say. Um, of course, get out in the streets and manifest, manifestation is always good. But more and more we understand it helps for nothing. Because politicians don't care. Maybe politicians care, but economy don't care. So, as a, I think the, the only way to really scare them and make a problem to them it's, it's not going out in the streets. I don't say that we don't have to go out in the streets, but the only way to really scare the system is not collaborate. It means no buy. Yes. Boycott. Boycott. No, no use, no buy. Be, find your own autonomy. Make your own food. Make, if you smoke, make your own grass. Don't buy to mafia. <laughs> True. If you need vegetables, make grow your own vegetables. Mm -hmm. If you, but it's, it's the only way they're gonna get scared if you don't buy because economy is the boss, money is the boss, and money is the dictator. So the only way is to try to, to avoid the more possible to buy. And, and so all things that are not really necessary in your life, get rid of it. Personally, I got no mobile phone, I got no car, because I don't need. Because I, simply because I don't need. So some kids of the neighborhood look at me as I'm a Martian, <laughs> because I got no car. <laughs> they say, this guy, this guy is crazy. When I met them in a the subway, what? Manu, hey, what? But, so very good relation, but the little kids of the neighborhood, after 10 minutes of good vibe, they say, they start thinking, they say, Manu, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm going to the airport. Is this, is this, you got no car. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's so much influence by television that I really think that I'm totally dumb. <laughs> There's a kind of barrier coming. They say, this guy is crazy. This guy is not normal. It happens a lot of times because I use a lot of subway and when I meet the kids, really often there's so much involved about, about what is television. That, that, that's the big problem, I think. I don't know how it is here, but I think it's the same as, as in Europe. Actually, the big problem, a terrible problem, is that uh, is the problem. And uh, is the terrible problem, it should be also the solution. I mean, the real problem is education. And actually, in Europe, there's a kind of more and more this fucking private education coming up for a certain class that, that didn't exi existed when I was young. When I was young, in France, school was for everybody, free. But now, more and more, 
we see this kind of difference. Private schools for people that got money and want good teachers, and uh, and uh, popular school for everybody, less and less money, so getting worse, worse, worse. And that's that's a terrible thing. So people that go to ordinary school, I mean all the people from the neighborhoods, they don't believe anymore in school. They don't care a damn about school. They don't care a damn about what say his dad or his mom. The only thing they really, the only school they got and they believe in is television. Television is the only real teacher they believe in. So it means everything quick, everything without too much work. If you work a lot, you're a fucking asshole. If you, got, if you have the things quick, you're the man. Not any kind of ethic of work. If you work a lot, you're an asshole. If you don't work and get everything, you're the man. Everything quick, quick, quick. No, and that's the worst education a child can have. And 99% of the kids growing actually in the neighborhoods of the planet are educated this way. So what is this raising actually all around the world is millions and millions of little mutants. It's true. That don't have the good education. And let's wait and see 10 years what's happening. So I think it's really, really important now that society realize that we have to start again with the next generation that's coming now, that's three, got three, four years old now. Give them a better education. If not, maybe it's gonna be the end of a civilization. Um, yeah, I believe in that. And um, because you cannot, you cannot educate, let the, the, all the children of the planet be educated by television. Television. Television don't respect nothing, so it's gonna make kids that don't respect nothing. Thank you for your question. Stephen. Yeah. When, in a third, I can finish with that. <laughs> when television could be the most wonderful university of imaginable. It could be the best way of education possible. Imagine, you can, you can be educated at home. <laughs> uh, and maybe it's gonna be better with internet, you know, because now ch children with internet, they're not obliged to watch something that is decided for them. Now, I saw with my kid, a few years ago, he was kind of on TV and there was the battle of all parents try to put your, your child a little bit out of TV. All parents know the problem. They're kind of hypnotized. And now they change to internet. So at least something changed, maybe in a positive way, is that they can make their own choice. I think that's a little bit better. That's something I, I maybe is positive. We can argue about that. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I think it's a little bit better. Other things about education that, uh, as I told you, I've been raised in a, in, a, in a public school that was, by the time in France, quite good. But there's some things I'm really angry with them because they didn't learn me that. They, nobody at school when I was a young kid Make me understood at school that what, how is important food, what you eat or don't eat, if you eat good things or bad things. That means nobody explained me, no professor explained me at school to be my own doctor, to never get sick if you get, eat only good food. And it, good food is not at least don't have to be expensive. It's, it's only 
put things good in your body. That's the base of anything of your life. That's the basic, what you breath, what you eat. There's nothing more basic than that. I never learn about breathing at school. I never learn about eating at school. And that's the base. You cannot be a well-developed human being if you don't know how to breathe, if you don't know what you're eating. That's basic. Finish. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen. And I have to learn by myself. Uh, it's no, it took me 40 years. I would have liked to learn that when I was 15 or 10, or, because uh, now I would be more evaluated for sure. Can I go? <laughs> <laughs> when, when people hear the word Latino, um, people have different interpretations of what it means, and especially coming here to university, people get lost sometimes. And I was just curious to know, what do you think is the most accurate representation of Latino? Or what images come to mind when you hear the word Latino? Well, I'm going to... When, uh, when they ask me about this question, they say, when somebody say, what are you doing? They say, ah, I play Latin music. I say, what it means? Latin music is so huge. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of cultures, different cultures, totally different cultures in what they're talking, Latin music. Um, Porro de Colombia is Latin music. Uh, in a certain way, uh, I don't know, uh, is flamenco considered Latin music? In Europe, yes. Uh, very, very different. So it's it's a very, very huge word that includes thousands and thousands of different cultures for me. For me, Latino, it's a it's a nice flag, but it, but it's thousands of different cultures inside of that. It's too for me. It's too easy to generalize Latino. Uh, there's thousands of different Latinos, thousands of different cultures inside the word Latino. That's my opinion. So to, to say Latino is this or that, for me, to answer this question is impossible. Latin, Latino is a constellation of different cultures. So we're, we're going to have time for two more questions, and then we're going to be able to have a reception and hang out a bit after. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Viri, and I'm, I was born and raised in Tijuana. So hearing your song earlier, it makes me really think about the influence that you know, the city has had in your music. Um, I left the city a few years back, and I'm doing well here in LA. But you know, when I go back, unlike you, when you go back to France and think it's beautiful, I think you know, that TJ, Tijuana is really doing not so great. Um, but I'm curious to know how that connection with the city came about. How did it bring you to write that song? And you know, any border town in general, how does that influence your music? <laughs> I arrived Tijuana first time um, with Mano Negra, uh, maybe 90, 89. And uh, We were coming from the United States, little first tour in California, first time in my life. They say, you're going to play in Tijuana. I went to Tijuana. Uh, we start rehearsing, we're making sound check in a club. Uh, what I understood after was basically only for Americans. And I have the chance that uh, there was a band there called Tijuana No and in particular, Luis Guarena, yes. that came there and, and quite angry <laughs> and said, man, you have to get out of here. Tijuana is not this. And so we met really close friends with Luis, with Alex, with all the Tijuana, mm -hmm. with Ceci. And, uh, and I had very, very good uh, friends in Tijuana that show me the real reality of the city. 
So uh, after I went a lot of times there, after Mano Negro and the band split, I went back there, I spent more time and experiences the everyday life. Uh, I'm never gonna forget living with Luis in La Coahuila there, oh in his house <laughs> in the parking of La Coahuila was something, I'm never gonna forget in my life. And experience the everyday life of there and uh, it's part of, it's a little part of my life for sure. Hi, Manu. Uh, I just want to start by saying that I really enjoyed your show a couple nights ago at Smoke Out. I don't know if anyone else was there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, uh, it seems like you have this image um, that you, that's being portrayed as a social critic, an economical critic, a political critic, musician, obviously, a musical artist. But what can you tell us about yourself that we may not know? Who is Manu Chow? when he gets home and the lights are off. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, it's a difficult question, but more and more I try to, I'm getting my way on this answer. I mean, Manu Chao is a, he's a little guy that has been really lucky in his life. Really lucky. You know, um, because my dreams that when I was a teenager, now I'm 49, so it's time for balance of life in a certain way. Uh, now when I go back to my neighborhood, you know all the bunch of kids, we were teenagers, always 16, 17, that think having a lot of dreams, what we're gonna do in life. In my neighborhood, I'm the lucky one. There's no doubt, half of my neighborhood are deaf. Uh, dead because of drugs. Heroin has been a genocide in Europe in, uh, for my generation. Uh, others done some things, but I'm the lucky one. So first, what I really know is that I'm a lucky guy. I'm, uh, I'm not ashamed to be a lucky man because I've been working for that. I really believe if you are lucky, if one day you, luck comes next to you, you can grab it. But if you didn't work before, this luck is going to burn your head. You have to be ready. And uh, I think I've been also lucky that what, uh, when um, I've, I've done, I went to school, 18, they, they said, oh, you can go to university but also the gang was there outside, so I couldn't leave at night and day. And I decided, let's go to the gang and to rock and roll and, and another school that is the streets. So I, I've been to university only three days in my life, only to have the security, I mean, to, <laughs> to come buy my medicine, like a lot of people there. But, uh, so, but but I, I worked, I worked, I worked, I worked. I worked a lot, my music. Even now, I could do nothing. I mean, well, not work so much. I got my songs, I got everything. I could just play and have fun. But I work, I like working. A lot of my friends say, Manu, you work too much. But I say, I'm not working, I'm having fun. That's what really I'm a lucky man. It's because my passion became my job. I'm paid with what I like. Not so much people got this opportunity. I got it. That's why I'm a lucky man. I can spend 15 hours a day working. It's not a problem for me. It's a pleasure. And I know it's a, that's a luxury. I don't know the word. That's a privilege. That's a privilege. So that's what I am first. I'm a lucky man. And after... Uh, I think uh, and I also try to be an honest man. I think that's what I learned from my parents. I love my parents for that, my mom and my dad, because they are two honest people. And they, so I, if I want to follow them, that's, that's the road. So I try to, <laughs> to go straight as possible. <laughs> and, uh, and that's it, and now, I'm a musician, 
more and more I, I, I feel that at least I am a musician. And now I wanna, as I said when I left university, I say, oh, now university is too, is not the moment because, but I, I was a good student. I'd like to study when I was young. Uh, I was interested by history, geography. I love that. It was not that I didn't like school, I liked. But after I met the neighborhood, and the neighborhood was another kind of school. So I couldn't do both. So I decided for one. But I always say, oh, one day I will go back to university one day. And maybe soon it's going to be time. So I don't know how to explain about Manu Chao. Manu Chao also, also, when I go around in bars, I can listen and hear stories about Manu Chao's I never saw in my life. I mean, <laughs> the talk, <laughs> and there's thousands of histories and legends, and, and that's funny. I, I can handle with that. It's not a big problem. I'm a shy guy that became famous. That's something strange, but I have to deal with that. Not easy for me. I think what has been, I've been lucky in the fact that I didn't become famous like boom in one day. It was little by little, so I had time to, to get used to it. I think it's, it's really normal. A young guy of 20 years old playing any kind of music is coming from the neighborhood and quick, pow, big, massive uh, medias and everything. You can go mad. It's normal. I think I've been lucky to, it was homeopathic, little by little. <laughs> So I get time to get used, and that's, I think that's been part of the lucky of not getting totally insane. Yeah. I don't Thank know you. what to talk more about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Manuel. <laughs> thank you, I just, I want to thank you so much so much for coming tonight and, and Pleasure. sharing your stories and to thank all of you for being here tonight. Please give a warm round of applause for Manu Chao.